Kirkaha. I call <coughs> Dr. Rajin Prasad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, it's, uh, I wish I could say it's a pleasure to take my last call on this bill, because I don't think it is a pleasure. In fact, it's uh, with some sadness that I get to speak on this particular bill uh, in the th third region. Uh, Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, for the from the time that this bill has been in the House, we've looked. We've looked for some kind of logic that the bill was trying to present that we could agree with, that we could, we could relate to, and that could relate also to the reality of what we find out there. We searched and we examined and we listened very carefully to the thinking of those who are experts by anybody's calculation, who presented to the Select Committee, people who have researched this field, who work in this field every day, and who came to the Select Committee with a lot of thinking and a lot of experience behind them to tell us what, what they saw in this bill and what was the gap between what ought to happen and what was being provided in this, in this bill. And really what we found that all of the, a big gap between all the factors that need to be taken into account to make life better for our children and for our mums and for our families and what the provisions of this bill pro provide. So for us, uh, Mr. Speaker, there was a real uh, disconnect between what the government has said it's trying to do and what this bill will produce from our perspective. Uh, government members are convinced that, that these are the only provisions that will reduce welfare numbers. And this, this has been their driving uh, goal throughout this, what will reduce welfare mem members. And those who submitted told us they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. And yes, we did work hard this select committee, and I wish we would have worked hard to, to, to understand what they were telling us as well. In fact, in my view, members of the select committee from the government side have actually not argued their points with any rigour. You know, throughout, particularly in the third reading debate, uh, where we went clause by clause, the, the rigour was not there. It was left, it was left time and time again, Mr. McIndoe, time and time again, it was left to the minister to take call after call from the chair and, and simply explain the same uh, logic, the same things that will happen. There'll be wraparound services, this will be great, etc. And, and, and that happened time and time again. Members were obviously not that convinced. They were very ready to clap when the minister gave one of our five or ten minute uh, renditions from the chair in the select committee stages, but certainly they did not uh, expand rigorously their argument. So they were, un they were uh, not unconvincing. But let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. Labour believes, and this side of the House believes passionately, in, in investment, in actually investing in those who are likely to be caught and who are likely to find themselves uh, caring for young children on their own, or, or adolescents for that matter. But no, we, we, we agree that we ought to invest in that particular group. Uh, and, and we would invest in helping young people prepare much better for their adult lives on, uh, and for the late, uh, uh, earlier adult, adult lives. We would provide sole parents with real opportunities to prepare for work through uh, uh, programs like the Training Incentive Allowance, which the other side does not believe in. Uh, we know uh, they work, Minister, because they worked for, for the Minister herself. And so she is our best uh, case in point, if you like. But that is all gone. And what we now find, the, the, the government members put in the place of that, is the rhetoric of investment. And the rhetoric of investment is hollow. Uh, because it, it somehow takes a word that has uh, positive connotations and imp imp imposes that on the logic of this bill, trying to make it good. It's quite interesting. When Labour spends money on social services and on welfare, then it's welfare dependency. When the government spends money, oh, then it's investment. Now, that's, that's, that's intellectually dishonest. Um, and and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's quite amazing that Tim McIndoe uh, gets up and talks about this side of the house being, being dogmatic in terms of dogma, 
Well, that's exactly what that member is doing, and that's exactly what our government is doing. Absolutely dogmatic. And, and, and it's absolutely unfounded by research and by anything else. A dogma does not need, does not need that kind of logic. And I, I, thought that, I thought this government was going to be research, evidence-based, evidence-led. Well, they're not. The government, we, we have said throughout this debate, the government is focused only on getting people off welfare, and it seems, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's at any cost. And it is, and, and they deny this, but this is their only motive. Uh, they try to mask this in, in the language I've talked about, the language of investment, etc. And the language of wraparound services. Who argues against wraparound services? Of course, we should have wraparound services. That should be there now. There's nothing radical about that. Uh, but, but they haven't given us the logic of how that's going to be done. What they, what they really do, they have really been narrow in their analysis. You know, you know, for one member, it was, oh, these young women have a lifestyle choice. For another, it's about, it's about uh, hope and ambition. Uh, another, it's just a new system. What is it? Why don't they get their, their members opposite in the government, get that their ways around? And my friend and colleague, Mr. McIndoe, tells me he came to the House just for this purpose. I want to say to Mr. McIndoe, why did he bother? Because if this was to be his finest hour, why did he bother? Because I don't think this has got that. that. And of course, for the minister, it's a bit like you know, the cavalry. You know, uh, hope is on its way. I think oh, change is on its way. The cavalry is coming. And when we examine the arguments they have, they have uh, presented, Mr. Speaker, we've exposed all of them. Work is the best way, uh, uh, and, and therefore, therefore, we must have work testing. Well, of course, work, you know, work is the best response to welfare. Create work. We've heard enough about that. But this is not what, they, what they've been saying. There's no real plans to create that work, only a concession that if there's no work there, then this won't apply. Then why bother? Why do we focus on wraparound services? Why do we focus on getting those who are on benefits the best place possible to enter the workforce, which is what the previous program was, which is what that minister herself is the beneficiary of. And, and, and good on her, and I've congratulated her in other speeches, that she took the opportunities that were made available then and found their way through it. Why do we now pull the ladder for others? Uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it seems as if this whole bill and this whole area of welfare reform is designed to pacify a group of their constituency who really believes that the problems of New Zealand can be traced to those who are on welfare. And if, they, if we didn't have that, then we would, everything else would be fine. The same, uh, Mr. Speaker, when we get to their arguments about parenting. This is an anti-parenting bill. A mother of a one-year child, one-year-old, now has to be work tested, has to be work tested, and if there's a five-year-old as well, then that mother will not have, have access, uh, not have the time that she needs to care for the child. She will have, that is the bill, ma ma Amy Adams, that is in the bill, and that is in the bill. Read the bill, Minister, because that's in the bill. And but that's the irony of it. I wonder, Mr. Speaker, whether members opposite and members of the Cabinet really understand what this bill is about. The same with a mother with a 14-year-old. The 14-year-olds under this government are on their own. Maybe I said to that member. They're on their own because there will be no protection if their mothers happen to be welfare beneficiaries. So that's what this government has produced. And yet we know from all of the evidence where we know that that young age and that older age, Mr. Speaker, is exactly when the caring abilities of the parents are, are needed for those children. So they, this side is passionate about this bill is because this government is destroying family life. They pretend to be family orientated. They are destroying family life. There's a bill next week, but we'll do it as well. We'll argue the same arguments next week. And that's what this government is doing. Then they bring on people like John Banks, who, who tells us in a hideous, sycophantic way that this is the best thing since sliced bread. When did John Banks become relevant to this parliament? All he's done is take inane, inane calls on points of order about somebody using a particular word. And, and, that, and that's, and, and, uh, Mr. Speaker, there is just so much wrong about this bill, from the get-go to the close-down now. 
We have argued consistently that it's bad. We have also looked to see what could be salvaged, and it's not much. Thank you. Wonderful speech. Great. Wonderful. Great speech. For um, Mike Saban. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.